All right, so with the public key cryptography, one question arises, how can we distribute the public keys? So, you know, uh, in order for us to, uh, for instance, use RSA encryption or Algamal encryption, we should know the public key uh, of the person so that we can encrypt our message and send it to them so that they can decrypt. Or if you're using PGP and so on, we should know the public key. So uh, one method is public announcement. For instance, a lot of people put their PGP keys to the end of their emails or put the, their web pages. So one way is this, but of course this is not a, uh, efficient way of doing it because if you want to send an email, you have to you know search the internet or somehow find that public key, and this is also uh, allows impersonation because, for instance, if I don't have a PGP public key and don't announce it on the web, somebody might create a web page as if it is created by me and put a PGP key and impersonate me. So this is not. Uh, proper way of doing it. But of course, sometimes it works for instance, think about cryptocurrencies. What you do is that everybody know their public key because this is how they generate their you know, accounts or wallets. So they actually uh, tell you, tell to somebody else when they want to you know, receive money from them. But of course, since you are going to uh, you know, do the transaction, this way you can actually give them their, uh, give them your, uh, uh, wallet account, which is actually somewhat uh, is mapped to your public key. Of course, in some scenarios it works, but sometimes it may not work. So another method is to, you know, put every public key in a directory. So think about, you know, maybe 15 years ago, we had phone books, you know, you could uh, alphabetically search for a name and find the phone number of somebody. So this is something like this. Instead of phone numbers, now we are putting public keys in a directory. So what happened in the phone books also applies to here because in this scenario, you find some, you find somebody, find the phone number, call them, and realize that they actually, you know, left that apartment maybe five years ago. So you, it is hard to update it all the time. Okay, so public available directory might also fail in this scenario in terms of public keys. Third uh, option is the public key authority. This is also so used in practice. So there is an authority. It keeps every public key of the people they, you know, when they create their public key. So an authority keeps it. So this is a good method, but also uh, having a single authority to have these public keys. Uh, you can also, you know, cause a denial of service attack. For instance, assume that you are visiting a web page and you just want to check the public key. If you always ask to uh, authority if that public key is, you know, what the public key is and so on, you know, uh, uh, you might cause a distributed denial of service attack because everybody now have to go to a single authority and ask for a public key. So it is easier to check instead the public key certificates. So this is why, what we are going to talk about. So certificate works like this. So for instance, you have Bob's information here, Bob's public key and the certification authority information. So what they do is as follows. Uh, This is the unsigned certificate containing user ID, user public key, and so on. So uh, they put it uh, into a hash function. So this is the hash of the unsigned information. Then the certificate authority encrypts this hash using their private key. So this happens in many scenarios. Even a driver that you download for Windows works like this. So this is the driver, for instance. Uh, Windows calculates the hash of it and signs it. So the sign part here added to the bottom of this certificate, and this is now called the certificate. Okay, this is the signed certificate. Again, in case of drivers, this operating system signs it. In case of like public keys certificates, this here we have the public key information, and the certificate authority actually signs it like this. Okay. 
So when you obtain a certificate, what you do is as follows. Uh, you also take the hash of this public value, obtain the hash, which is this unsigned hash value. This is the signed certificate. So uh, certificate authority use their private key to sign it. Now you actually use the certificate authority's public key to decrypt it and check if these two hashes match. If they match, then you know uh, you verify the Bob's public key. So this is what actually your browsers do. Your browsers contain the public keys of certificate authorities. So whenever you the browser sees a web page, this is what they check. So if you don't trust the certificate authority. Uh, generally, you can go to the settings of your browsers and you know uh, click on the certificate authorities that you want to trust and not. But by default, you trust everybody, which might not be a good idea. Okay, so there are many types of certificates. X509 is one of the most known and used uh, standards. So there are many versions of it. So initially, the, in the version one, uh, you had things like this version, certificate serial number, algorithm and parameters. These are for signature algorithm identifier and uh, issuer name, period of validity. So a certificate will not be valid after this after date, subject name and subjects, public key info, algorithms, parameters, and key. Again, if you're like using elliptic or digital signatures, then you have the domain parameters here. The, you know, the hash functions and so on, which you are using are defined in this algorithms part. So in the extended version, there are some more fields, but all of the versions at the end contain the signature, okay? Encrypted hash parameters and algorithms. There, in case of uh, certificates, we also have a certificate revocation list because you may say that this certificate is valid until, for instance, 2030. But due to something else, maybe the certificate authority wants to, uh, you know, uh, delete this certificate. So what they do is that uh, they instead include it in a, a revocation list. So uh, browsers or the verifiers first check if the sig this signature is revoked. If it is not revoked, then they check if it is valid. This is how it works in practice. All right. So. Before uh, finishing, let's talk about key sizes. So we talk about symmetric key cryptography first. We said that 128-bit security is suggested for personal use. So less than 128, I never suggested. But if you want military-grade security, you can use AES-256. Okay, but due to... Uh, Sub-exponential time algorithms for factoring. So if you want to use RSA and want 128-bit security, your RSA modulus should be as large as 3072 bits. If you are going to use, for instance, digital signature algorithm, like discrete logarithm, it depends on discrete uh, logarithm problems. So in that scenario, your secret key can be as small as 256 bits due to Polar's row algorithm. So it is the double of this, but group size has to increase again to 3072 bits. So if you use digital signature algorithms, these are the parameters I suggested. But if you use elliptic curve digital signature algorithms, your uh, secret key is now reduced to 256 bits. This is why we generally prefer elliptic curves compared to RSA because for this modulus, RSA is fast, but if we want military grade security, which is 256 bit, you can simply use AES 256 for symmetric key algorithms. If you use elliptic curve cryptography like Algamal and so on, you can choose your secret key as 512 bits. But now if you want RSA, your factoring model should be 15,000 bits. This is a huge number and arithmetic here might be slower than expected. And you know, designing and hardware uh, capable of um, performing operations with on these huge numbers might be slower than expected. And in practice, what I've seen that people are still using this too. Okay. Even in military, some people are still using this. So you, we should move on to this part. This is why we are starting to see less uh, standards where you, they use this kind of factor modules. Okay, so this picture should be the you know main takeaway from the 
uh, symmetric key and public key uh, cryptography. So we talk all of these algorithms now, so now we can understand this table. This is important because people still rely on old papers like from 2000s, and they still submit papers where they think that RSA 1024 is secure. So they still, uh, there are still uh, academic paper submissions where they think that this is secure or they suggest 80 bit security and so on. But for personal use, we recommend this. For military grade security, we recommend this. All right. To finalize, let's talk about quantum computers. So we said that integer factorization or discrete logarithm and elliptic or discrete logarithm problems are somewhat hard and we don't have polynomial time algorithms to solve it. But the problem is that if somebody builds a very huge quantum computer, they can actually solve these problems in polynomial time. I mean, with the smaller versions, they can also solve this in polynomial time, but currently the qubits are really small, so they can factorize, for instance, two digit or three digit numbers. But if you can build a very huge quantum computer, then you can solve these problems in a very fast way. So we don't know if the technology or the engineering will allow it to have such a huge quantum computer at some time in at a point in time in the future, but we still should be ready for it. So quantum computers reduce the security of symmetric key cryptography to half. So it is enough to double the key size. For example, you can move from AES-128 to AES-256 to avoid attacks from quantum computers, but also reducing the security to half might not be that much of a problem because by this, actually this means that quantum computers can break AES-128 by performing two to the 64 operations but performing two to the 64 operations now will be on not classical computers, but on quantum computers. So we don't know if we would have such quantum computers anyway. So this is why generally we don't care much about uh, on the si side of symmetric key cryptography or you know, finding hash collisions will not be that easy by quantum computers. Thus we need quantum safe algorithms for, for for public key cryptography like key exchange algorithms or encryption algorithms and so on. So uh, elliptic curve cryptography structure can still be used but with a quantum safe problem instead of the discrete logarithm problem. For example, finding isogenies is a quantum safe problem but still uh, currently we have the post quantum key cryptography uh, standardization process and algorithms that based on this problem actually got eliminated in the, I think the second round. And we also have the finalist, uh, like which was announced in July, as far as I remember. So currently we have a, an algorithm for uh, post quantum key encryption, but we still need, I think still uh, having an ongoing process to choose key exchange algorithms and so on. But currently our knowledge is not that good because in this competition, uh, many candidates which were claimed to be quantum secure actually were broken by a classical computer. So probably these uh, standards will be updated and you know, we will have better algorithms in the following future. But still we don't know if we can have such a quantum computer anyway. So NSA's recent recent policy, I actually say recent, but it is from 2015. So NSA always supported elliptic curve cryptography and always suggested migration from RSA to ECC in the future. But all of a sudden in 2015, NSA suggested not to waste time migrating from uh, RSA to ECC, sorry, this is a typo here, but suggested development, standardization and commercialization of new quantum safe algorithms. And as I mentioned, ECC and RSA are not quantum safe. This announcement puzzled many people because they thought that maybe somebody is getting close to building such a huge quantum computer. However, considering the budget of NSA and how much they reserve for post quantum cryptography, it is highly unlikely that they are about to build such a huge quantum computer. And from 2015 to now, they are about to you know, enter 2023. We haven't seen any progress from NSA side on the, this kind of quantum computer uh, engineering. My personal opinion is that it is more likely that since they lost the dual EC, uh, dual elliptic curve uh, digital random bit generator, 
maybe since they use this lost as power, NSA wanted to ask to stay on the RSA side instead of elliptic curve cryptography because it is kind of easier to attack RSA compared to elliptic curve cryptography. So if you want to have more information about this topic, there is a very nice paper by uh, Neil Koblis and Alfred Menezes from 2015 titled A Riddle Wrapped in an Enigma. They actually argue why, you know, uh, breaking uh, elliptic curve cryptography will be highly unlikely in the you know, foreseeable future. So if you're interested, you can also check the current process in the NIST ongoing post-quantum cryptography competition. <laughs>